With our large inventory of dumpsters and grapple truck services, we provide an unmatched, dependable service. Our sister company, Island Recycling, buys and collects recyclables such as AC units, aluminum cans, auto batteries, copper, and much, much more. For Cayman's Waste and Recycling Solution, one call takes care of it all. Call 946-DUMP. That's 946-3867. If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Savannah Primary School. <coughs> My name is Paul Biles, and I am the President-Elect of the Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be presenting the Chamber and District questions to the candidates this evening. I'd like to thank all of the candidates for joining us this evening. For all of our 19 forums, all candidates received an invitation to meet their voters and answer our questions. The role of the Chamber of Commerce is to support, promote, and protect the interests of the membership and the wider Cayman Islands community. This year, and for the foreseeable future, the Chamber Council have focused the attention of the Chamber on the importance of education and lifelong learning. Tonight's forum is just one of many educational initiatives that we have developed, and we have enabled voters to inform themselves on their candidates for over 30 years. We have seen hundreds of voters attend these forums to meet their candidates, and thousands of people have watched the forums on both Cayman 27 and YouTube. It is encouraging to see the engagement from voters in the run-up to Election Day on Wednesday, May 24th. Another educational initiative is our Growth Matters campaign, which was launched on April 5th. The initiative seeks to educate the community and our youth about the importance of economic growth and inform people as to how our economy actually functions. A series of 10 animated, educational, and fun videos were created to explain the stages of economic growth, and they can all be viewed at www.growthmatters.ky on the Chamber's YouTube channel and on social media sites. So far, tens of thousands have engaged with this campaign, and we are delighted to see the positive impact it is having on our community. But tonight is about Newlands. Tonight, voters have the chance to inform themselves on the Newlands candidates hearing their responses to a series of national and constituency concerned questions. This year, with the implementation of one person, one vote system, it is more important than ever that voters inform themselves. The voting constituencies have also been subject to change with 19 electoral constituencies now identified. Voters are reminded that voter ID cards are now available for collection. This Saturday, May 6, voter registration cards will be available from collections from the election office at Smith Road Center from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Voters will require a valid form of photo ID to collect their voter card, such as a passport or a driver's license. Other information pertaining to these elections, including voting locations, can be found by visiting the elections page on caymanchamber.ky. Tonight's questions have been developed from submissions by chamber members and the wider community. We will be accepting questions this evening as well, but questions must be directed to all candidates. You can also submit questions for future forums by emailing your suggestions to info at caymanchamber.ky. I would like to thank the chamber staff for their assistance in organizing these forums, as well as Hurley's Media for broadcasting the forums live on Cayman 27 and online. Special thanks to our corporate sponsors for their support, including the DART organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Puritan Cleaners. Mr. Will Panu, our chief executive officer, will be tonight's moderator. He will explain the rules of the forum and he will then introduce tonight's candidates. Good evening, candidates. Good, e good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions, and you'll have two minutes to respond if you choose to do so. One ring on the, will indicate that you have 30 seconds remaining to, to your response time. 
So again, each candidate, once you reach that minute 30, you'll hear a ring, and then you'll have 30 seconds to conclude. And you'll, the second ring will come up, and you can wrap up your thought. So if you're in the middle of it, just wrap it up. The seating for tonight was arranged by random. Everyone just selected their number. That's as to why, that's why you're seated where you are. And we're asking you to keep your conversations and um, responses so that there's no real personal attacks throughout the evening. And at the conclusion of this question time, we will allow each candidate to deliver a two-minute closing statement. And again, I wish each of the candidates good luck this evening. And when I return, I'll be introducing the candidates for Newlands right after this commercial break. Seven Mile Beach Resort and Spa. At Kirk's Home Center. You can find everything to adapt, decorate, or furnish your home at Kirk Home Center. Discover every tool for any task in our hardware department. Fuel your imagination with our extensive range of housewares and linens. Create a home outside your house from our variety of outdoor living items. Or plan your next project in our paint and do-it-yourself section. For the widest variety of stylish and up-to-date items for your home. Make Kirk Home Center your first choice. We got a great dinosaur for you. Hi, I'm Caroline Hobby, host of Nashville Insider, where we bring you the latest in country music news and happenings. Join us as we interview your favorite artists and go behind the scenes of country music's hottest events. Watch Nashville Insider right here on Cayman 27. It's fresh, fresh from the garden, it's fresh. Fresh from the baker, it's fresh. Fresh from the fisherman, always have her. It's fresh, fresh from the butcher. It's fresh, fresh from the deli. It's fresh, fresh from the summer rain. Always have her. At Hurley's, everything is fresh, and we mean everything. Welcome back to the Savannah Primary School where we have three of the candidates in this year's election for Newlands. There are 1,256 voters in the constituency, so we hope that people who are watching on television listen very carefully as well as the ones in the audience here to the responses of the candidates. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the three candidates for this constituency and we'll begin as they are seated. We begin with Wayne Panton. He's the third elected member for Bodentown and is currently serving in the Legislative Assembly as the Minister for fin Financial Services, Commerce, and Environment. Mr. Patton is a qualified attorney and was a partner at Glo Walker's Global from 1997 to 2011. He has also held numerous committees, um, positions on numerous committees and organizations and serving as a president of the Camanian Bar Association and chairman of the Port Authority of the Cayman Islands, just to name a few. Mr. Panton is seeking re-election as a Progressives candidate for Newlands. Welcome. Our next candidate is Raul Gonzalez, Jr. He's a businessman and entrepreneur who owns three local companies, Ready Mix Concrete, Cayman Parts, Tires and Equipment, and Blue Water Island Adventure Tours. He's a member of the Baptist Church on Pedro Castle Road, and he serves as one of the leaders for the church's youth group. Mr. Gonzalez, Jr. is seeking election as an independent candidate for Newlands. Welcome. Mr. Alvis Suku served in the Legislative Assembly. He serves in the Legislative Assembly from 2013 to 2016. During this time, he was appointed as Counselor for Information Technology and Counselor for Sports. He also served as a government backbench MLA before resigning from the government um, bench in 2016, early 2016. Mr. Suku is an information technology specialist with a Bachelor of Science degree from DePaul University in Chicago and holds an MBA from Syracuse University. He is seeking election as an independent candidate for Newlands. 
Welcome. Thank you. I now turn it over to Mr. Biles to pose the first question this evening. Thank you, Will. First question, we will start with uh, Mr. Saku. Explain why you have decided to run for election in 2017 and why should Newlands voters elect you to serve as their representative in the LA? But to answer the first part, I, um, I am seeking re-election. Um, I'm hoping to be the first elected member for Newlands. Um, what I have decided a long time ago is that I wanted to serve this country. When I graduated university in 1994, it was my ambition from then to give back to the country. I had gotten great opportunity to expand my education and my horizons, and I came back here with experience and knowledge. And during the time in, my, in, in the private sector, as I worked, as, um, worked my way up from a computer programmer to an, a senior manager and then an IT director, starting my own business, um, having a, so, I think it was the only Caymanian owned software development company at the time. I gathered a lot of experience. I served on government boards. I worked with service clubs. I worked with the youth in boxing um, primarily, but um, in general too, I, I've mentored a lot of young people. And I, I started to feel that it was time for me to go into politics. Um, I've now served four years as, as a representative. And I do feel that I, I haven't given my best yet. I still have a lot to offer this country. Um, I think if you look at my track record, I have served well. I have stood up for the people. I have put the people first. Um, that is the, the rule that I live by. I always do what I think the, those who elected me are expecting from me. And um, I think I'm now ready to, to step up another level and serve this country as a minister. Um, I have performed well. I have served on both sides of the LA, both opposition and government, and I have that, that wealth of experience that most first-time MLAs don't have. So I am putting myself forward, and, and I think that I will represent, represent Newlands very well, and, and I, I will continue to listen to the people and, and I think do as they expect of me. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez, same question. Why have you decided to run for election in 2017? And why should Newlands voters elect you to serve as their representative in the Legislative Assembly? Good night. Thanks for the question. I'd like to thank the Chambers for hosting this event and for our viewers out there, my supporters. I decided to run for this election. I felt the calling. I saw the need. Uh, my people needed someone to speak out for them. Um, and defend them and their concerns in the LA. Um, I feel that I'm the preferred candidate because I'm, I'm for the people. I'm one of them. Um, I'm a successful businessman, an entrepreneur. Um, while there may be criticism that um, I have no LA experience, but I would like to remind everyone that no one was born with LA experience. Um, I would like to defend my people, like I say, um, represent them and be there for them. They need true representative representation right now, and I'm putting myself forward for them. I am not one of the persons that forget their people. Um, they have no voice. No one's out there representing them. So I put myself forward for that, for them, for the people of Newlands and the District of Bordentown. Thank you. Thank you. Same question to Mr. Padden. Why have you decided to run for re-election? in your case, in 2017, and why should Newlands voters elect you to serve as their representative in the Legislative Assembly? Thank you very much for the, the question, and I will join with my colleague here in thanking the Chamber for putting this on and, and, and wel welcoming those who are watching and those who are present. Um, you know, when I first ran in 2013, uh, I felt that there was a real necessity for um, someone like myself with some, you know, with experience in, in business um, and the, the ability to 
uh, commit myself to serving the country without having to worry about um, how I was, um, where I was going to be able to get funding from to to run a campaign, um, because I think that's that's um, that's you know significant. But having gone through that, um, having had the experience we've had over the last four years, and making very very significant progress in the country, making a real difference to the country and turning things around. I think today I feel um, that I have a, a real, I have a real passion now to complete the work um, and to advance the country further um, from where we are at today. Um, Cayman is a very special little place in the Caribbean and I'm not sure that everyone really um, appreciates and understands how, you know, how well we have been doing. But that's not to say it's perfect for everybody. And we want to do even better. We want to expand um, the opportunities and horizons of our people and really add to their quality of life. And our approach, my approach, is really not to do anything uh, unless it is for the best interest of Caymanians and the country as a whole. In Newlands, I, I was raised here. I'm a Newlands boy. Um, and I feel it's home to me, and that's, that adds something very special for me. Um, it, it's, it drives me further um, and really causes me to want to display my passion in serving the people in Newlands. Thank you. The next couple of questions will focus on immigration and labor. I will start with <coughs> Mr. Gonzalez. What programs or solutions would you recommend to address unemployment in Newlands? Thank you. Unemployment in Newlands, our immigration policies need to be reformed. We have a lot of people that are, don't have the skill sets and we need to get them educated and provide a level, uh, we need to provide an environment where they can be able to get those skill sets, um, to get them educated. Um, the ones that are educated and are unemployed, we have, to, we have to figure out a way with immigration with those work permits. We've got too much work permits out there. We have to um, get them, like I say, cut back on some of those work permits, put our Caymanians first, the ones that are qualified. The ones that are not qualified, we have to get them qualified, whatever means that, me whatever means that is to get them educated and qualified, we have to do that. We have to find the resources to do that and get them elevated and promoted and into the right jobs so they could be able to provide for their families. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Panton, what programs or solutions would you recommend to address unemployment in Newlands? Well, thank you. I, I think the, the issues surrounding unemployment in Newlands are really the, um, perhaps the same issues that might exist um, across the country. Um, we have um, situations where some of our children uh, graduate or come through school without having the necessary skills or meeting the expectations of the sort of modern employer today. Um, so our challenge really is to make sure that we address that issue and make sure that they are properly skilled. Um, the the issue with um, the issue with, with unemployment really can be addressed by ensuring that the there is a clear understanding from the business side who who employ people of what the what skills are required how um, they can satisfy the needs of the of the businesses um, and, and we as a as a as a country, we have to make sure that we address that properly. Thank you. Mr. Saku. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I think that unemployment can't be, you can't really focus in on one constituency. Um, it's a national issue. I know that in recent times the unemployment rate has fallen. But we do have a concern with, and, I, and specifically for our young people. Young people are not getting employment at the level and the rate that I think they should. Um, 
a lot of that has to do with education and training. Um, I, I'm a strong advocate for technical and vocational training. I don't think that we have tackled that at the level that we should have. Um, we have a TVET council that has met twice in the last two years, so clearly we're not taking it seriously. Um, you know, our young people are not coming out of school either if they've gone down the academic path or the, the technical and vocational path in a limited fashion, prepared to enter the workforce. Um, we need to spend a lot more time dealing with that issue. Education has to be our top priority. Um, our kids deal with entering a workforce and competing for, for what I call cheap labor jobs, the $6 an hour jobs. My view on that is that our kids should not be aiming for those jobs. Our kids should be aiming for the jobs above those. Um, this country has an appetite for cheap labor, and that is something that I think leads to the plethora of work permits that we see being approved regularly. But more specifically, dealing with Newlands, we need to encourage people, to those who have an entrepreneurial spirit, to develop in the, in the district, in, in the district of Bordentown. I won't specifically say Newlands, but we need to create the, the, the environment where people who have property or want to invest in, in themselves and build a business can do that, but especially small businesses. Small businesses create jobs. Those are the, the businesses that, that will hire Caymanians. So we need to encourage that. You know, the GOIS initiative was supposed to do that. We haven't done that in Bordentown for the past, I don't know how many years. We haven't really focused on Bordentown. I want our people to be able to live and work in our district. Thank you, Mr. Saku. Our next question will start with Mr. Panton. What policy reforms, if any, would you recommend for the processing of permanent residency and Caymanian status applications? Policy reforms? What policy reforms, if any? Well, thank you for the question. I. I think that the approach that we have taken right, reflects a, a reasonable approach of seeking to have the applicants demonstrate a, a level of commitment to the country, a level of commitment to their communities. And that is reflected in several ways um, by their personal engagement um, and involvement with the, with the community as a whole, but also investment um, in the country. And then obviously there's also the, the, the time element. Um, I personally think that that is not an unfair way of, of approaching it. So I wouldn't necessarily uh, propose any significant policy alterations. I do believe that uh, the system that we have been working under for not just the last four years or three years, but um, years before that, has certain deficiencies. In, which relate specifically to data. So if we're working on this, this point system, um, then that is effectively the problem um, and the deficiency in data and being able, being able to rely on, on these the points um, has been an issue and has been a part of the problem. I think if we can do anything, it's really to try to find a way to move away from the specifically relying heavily on the point system. Um, because I think many countries have realized that it doesn't really work that well. Um, but we still definitely need to have a demonstration of a willingness to engage, a willing, willingness to commit, to be a part of the community. Um, so, you know, un unless we can come up with an alter, uh, a different version of the point system um, or a different system altogether, which definitely demonstrates that, um, I think we'll, we'll have to continue with what we're doing, but we absolutely must um, fix the, the issue and fix the problem because people are in, entitled to be able to, um, if they become a part of the community and contribute, to, to live and exist within it. Thank you, Mr. Pannon. Mr. Saku, what policy reforms, if any, would you recommend for the processing of permanent residency and Caymanian status applications? Thank you. As Mr. Pannon pointed out, you know, we, we operate on a point system. I've long held the opinion that that point system may be a bit biased towards those who have wealth. Um, it may be giving a bit more weight to people who own property and so forth. And I know that we don't want to create PR um, recipients or have PR recipients and status recipients who are, 
who are not able to sustain themselves and, and you know, don't, and who will, will eventually may, may become a burden to the country. But I think one of the long-standing issues is that people that we have given permanent residence, residence to and status, um, not everyone, but some, have not properly integrated into Caymanian society. They have spent a lot of time here. Um, they have become Caymanians or PR holders, but they haven't adapted our culture. And we see that resonating through the business community um, in, in, the, in the form of complaints about discrimination and so forth. I think we need to focus more on the quality of individuals that we allow to come here and become Caymanian, uh, to live and, and live among us. I think that's where we need to focus if we were going to make any policy changes. Um, and we need to find a way to adapt that system to ensure that the individuals that we are allowing to come here and live with us and, and live among us are, are going to be receptive to our culture and not try to impose theirs. Um, I think that happens quite often. Um, I, I hear the complaints from Caymanians who are working in, 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 in the private sector who, f who feel the brunt of that. So I think a bit more effort needs to be put into ensuring the, the quality individual is, is being extended PR and, and status rather than just looking at what property they own and how many dogs they've walked. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Gonzalez, what policy reforms, if any, would you recommend for the processing of permanent residency and Cayman status applications? Well, unfortunately, I, like many of you, have not been privy to the rich report. So I'm uncertain with what, gov what the recommendations went to government to help and assist with this. Um, it's unacceptable how it's working now. A lot of people is in limbo. Um, paperwork is taking forever to process. Um, I think the delays, it's, you know, it's, it's just not working right now. You can't have people coming here and contributing and they just don't know where they stand. So I promise if elected and when elected, I will work towards rectifying that and make sure that the situation don't occur again. Um, for my people here in the Cayman Islands. Thank you. That completes the first round of questions. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back after these short messages. Catch the trials and the tribulations of the bold and the beautiful people of the fashion world of Beverly Hills. Watch The Bold and the Beautiful Afternoons on Cayman 27. It's a beautiful planet, and now you can see it right here on Cayman 27. In this series, we'll travel to some of the most fascinating places as we explore the UNESCO heritage sites found around the world. From Stonehenge to the Grand Canyon, there are thousands of sites that will leave you in awe. Beautiful Planet is a series that will take a closer look into these wonders of the world. Join us on Cayman 27, Mondays at 7 p.m. and Saturdays at 10.30 p.m. to witness this beautiful planet. The world is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky Seven Mile Beach Resort and Spa. Welcome back to the Savannah Primary School Hall, where we have the three candidates for Newlands. 
Mr. Wayne Panton, Raul Gonzalez Jr., and Alva Suku. We've completed the first round of questions. I'll now turn it back over to Paul for the second round. Thanks, Will. Our next question focuses on the pensions law. And we will start with Mr. Suku. Changes to the pensions law will affect foreign nationals working in the Cayman Islands, many of whom work in the tourism and hospitality industries. How do you intend to resolve this potential issue and fill the potential vacant jobs? Well, I, th I think that there are two answers to that question. Um, my first concern is why is it that there's a panic now? that there may be a mass exodus of individuals. Does that indicate that we haven't prepared Caymanians to take those positions? I think we have a limited time now that what we need to do is as quickly as possible, identify those positions, and insist that if, if, um, if, if businesses are, are, are projecting that they will lose employees, that those jobs immediately, immediately be advertised on the NWDA website and then WDA be tasked with finding Caymanians who are qualified and able to do those jobs. Um, going forward, clearly, I know what the issue stems from, um, you know, the collective bargaining, the bargaining power of the, the pension funds. If people are constantly withdrawing funds from, the fund, from that, that money, you know, there's a potential for less, or there's less potential to earn interest and so on, and gains. But um, I'm less sympathetic because I think that this indicates to me that a lot of companies have not been preparing, especially in the tourism industry, have not been preparing Caymanians to take these roles, and they've not been actively training Caymanians. So I'm less sympathetic, but I know that there is an issue. We can't allow businesses to, to, to suffer. So I think we need to, from now, start finding people who could potentially be recruited quickly, train quickly, and be prepared to take, take those positions when these individuals leave. Going forward, I think that, you know, I don't think we should change the law back to the way it was. I think that I agree with the pension providers. However, I do understand someone coming here for a limited time and, and wanting to leave and take their money with them. And you know that is an option available to them if it can be transferred to another pension provider. So I really don't see that, that we need to go back and make changes to legislation. However, you know, I am concerned about what will happen to the businesses in the, in the interim, and we need to start now looking for individuals to fill those jobs. Thanks, Mr. Sako. Mr. Gonzalez, changes to the pensions law will affect foreign nationals working in the Cayman Islands, many of whom work in the tourism and hospitality industries. How do you intend to resolve this potential issue and fill the potential vacant jobs? Well, we have a lot of Caymanians that are qualified, that are seeking employment and can't get it. So this is where they could step in now. These vacant jobs, we have to, Caymanians do come first. So the ones that are qualified has to get the job. And the ones that are not qualified, like I say, we have to provide that that environment where they can get qualified for these jobs. And we have to start educating our kids from the primary level um, to, to, to these job opportunities and see where they are going to go so we don't find ourselves in this position again. Um, and the one, like I said, the, and the ones that are not qualified, let's get those trade schools going right now and vocational so we could get them up and going. And if we have to get work permits for some, well, we'll just have to get some work permits back in. The pension, no, I don't, I don't agree with um, they're leaving the island and we're, hold, we're, they're not, uh, we're holding their funds for them or we could transfer it. I think um, some amendments has to be done with that, that they should be able to get their pension too when they pass away. So the pension law needs a lot of amendments. I see a lot of stuff that needs to be addressed with that. Um, another issue with the pension is we need to, we have Caymanians here that are um, losing their homes and we need to find a way where they could access um, some of their funds that they could get, save their homes. 
Um, if they have lo loved ones that are sick, um, they need to be able to access some of those funds too. So we have a lot of work to do with the pension. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pandon, shall I repeat the question? Yes, please. Changes to the pensions law will affect foreign nationals working in the Cayman Islands, many of whom work in the tourism and hospitality industry. How do you intend to resolve this potential issue and fill the potential vacant jobs? Well, I think we have to first recognize that this is not going to be an ongoing issue. It's a one-time um, situation um, triggered by a change in the law. Um, I don't think that any changes are required um, to, to address the issue. I obviously, as a member of the government, entirely supported the changes that were made. And the reason for the change was to ensure that the same types of provisions that apply to Caymanians also apply to um, people who may be here on a work permit, getting um, pensions paid by Caymanian businesses and then leaving. It's, it's just not fair for uh, someone on a work permit to be able to leave um, at year 10, for example, or year 9, um, a few months later, collect the pension in a lump sum and then come back um, a year later um, to work and continue. They may down the road um, apply for PR. Um, they may apply eventually for status and they may not have that money any longer. The point of a pension is to ensure that people are protected from themselves and that they have some income replacement down the road when they do retire. Um, if there is, um, and I, I know that you did, the Chamber did some sort of extrapolation of around a couple thousand possibly uh, jobs being affected, I agree that we're not going to get, um, we don't have enough Caymanians who are unemployed to fill those positions if that happens, but we can certainly make a significant dent in that. And there are lots of people out there who are willing to uh, come in and be um, new employees. So I really don't see that that is going to be a problem that can't be addressed. Caymanians can take advantage of this and we should ensure that, and the employers should step forward and ensure that they have first opportunity to take those positions. Thank you, Mr. Panna. Our next question focuses um, on population growth and the demographics in the country more generally. I'm going to start with Mr. Gonzalez on this first question. Some candidates during the election, and this election in particular, are recommending that there should be annual quotas established for the granting of permanent residency and Cayman status for persons who do not have generational ties. Do you support this recommendation? Um, yes, I do. I do support that. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to be um, overburdened. Our infrastructure could only handle so much, and we've got to take time to grow. I don't want, um, I don't want to see Cayman where it is right now and further down the line even worse with the burden of an influx of our population then. We do need people here. We do need growth. I ain't stopping that. But we have a lot of Caymanians that are left behind and we're growing too fast and they're not catching up. And I would like to take this time the next couple of years now to, to, to bring back our Caymanians that are left behind to enjoy the, the wealth, the prosperity of our Cayman Islands. Um, it's too much of them is way behind in terms of educated education, in terms of their work, um, their work placement. Um, so I, I really want to more focus on bringing those ones that we, that couldn't keep up with the pace and, and bring them up to speed and then we could see from there a little slower on the growth and focus on our Caymanian people right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Panton, 
Some candidates during this election are recommending that there should be annual quotas established for the granting of permanent residency and Caymanian status for persons who do not have generational ties. Do you support this recommendation? I don't support the recommendation. I, I think that we have to recognize that the country, at least at this point, um, the country has gone through a period where you know, the, the global financial crisis caused uh, a significant reduction in our um, population. Um, it isn't, over the last five years or so, the population has, has come back up now. Um, I don't think that we're at this point in danger of, of creating an, an overload on the system. And I think we have to recognize that for our country to, to work and succeed and continue to create opportunities for our, our own Caymanians and, and success for our own Caymanians, um, we will, for some time anyway, need to have a, a, a net inflow of, of, um, of, of workers. Um, at the same time, we must ensure that our people are getting the opportunities to to be able to advance and be a part of the um, of the of the success. Um, so I, you know, I'm not one of those that that thinks that you know the diversity that that new culture brings in and and new people being here brings in is is, is necessarily a bad thing. I think it has it has helped us. Um, you know, many of us. If you look at the U.S., for example, there is um, a long-standing view that because of immigration, they have been better for it. Um, I think, at least in at Cayman's, at this stage in our development, Cayman, I think that's that's still the case. Now, I may change my mind, you know, five years down the road or ten years down the road, but I think for right now, um, I think the system that we have uh, is serving us, and I don't believe that we should put these, these limitations in place. What we must put in place um, and put policies in place and, and strategies and programs in place is to ensure that our Caymanians um, can meet the needs um, and ab uh, achieve the opportunities of su for success in this country um, at the same time as anybody else is, is attracted here for that reason. Thank you. Mr. Sukul. Same question. Some candidates during this election are recommending that there should be annual quotas established for the granting of permanent residency and Caymanian status for persons who do not have generational ties. Do you support this recommendation? I think we've, we've created a quandary for ourselves because we, we've gone about establishing programs where we encourage people to develop businesses and become entrepreneurs um, for those businesses to flourish. You need, you need people, you need customers. You need people who you're gonna sell your goods and services to. But then we haven't invested enough in the, the supporting infrastructure to support population growth. So you know, the schools are overcrowded, the hospital is not operating as efficient as it should. Uh, we hear complaints about that. The, the emergency services are, we were paying loads of overtime to firemen just to, to be on, on, on duty. You know, we, we have really haven't done the infrastructure development that would support a sudden increase in, in population. Um, I don't really necessarily feel we need to have an, just an overall um, overarching quota on, on the grant of PR and so on for, for people who don't have generational ties, but I think we need to start being a bit smarter in how we're granting it, and I alluded to that earlier. You know, we have individuals who come here who are coming here, but they may not have much to offer. Um, we, need a, we also have people who are coming here um, and are occupied in, in positions that compete with Caymanians, trying to get into those positions. I think if we look at specific categories, especially when it comes to employment, of where these individuals are working, what jobs they're doing, um, and, and try to line that up with our educational efforts. Make sure that when they come here, they, um, they're not going to compete with a Caymanian, an existing Caymanian for employment and so on, and they're not going to end up putting too much strain on infrastructure, then we could put maybe establish quotas for certain specific categories of employment. But I, I wouldn't say um, just overall, because we do need population growth. To, so if we're going to encourage people to have businesses and, and develop businesses, they need, they need a, the supporting population. Thank you, Mr. Sakou.
Our next question uh, focuses on the national budget item. And we'll start with Mr. Panton. What do you consider to be the most important capital project to be addressed by the next government? I think, um, thank you for the question. I think the, one of the main issues that we'll have to address is whether um, we do this, this um, proposed uh, cruise port in terms of a capital project. Um, we have certainly done the work necessary to ensure that you know, the environmental impact assessment and the factors around that are known. Um, I think we need to ensure that it's clear whether um, there's going to be ongoing benefits uh, from this investment. Uh, we also need to ensure that, you know, the cruise lines, and I, I know we've, we're about to do, um, uh, we're about to receive the, the results from, or the input from um, KPMG on recommendations um, for um, the financing and the structuring. We need to ensure that there is, um, the cruise lines have uh, a legitimate um, sort of skin in the game, equity um, involved. The country shouldn't have a lot um, involved with this um, because there is, um, there is some degree of risk with it. But that is, is something that I think we have to carefully um, consider and make sure that when we go down this road that we are going to do something which is right for us as a country, um, right for our environment. I think, you know, sustainable development involves um, a compromise between the environment and, and development. And I think we need an essential um, cruise pier and um, cargo port expansion um, for the country to, to grow and to, and to survive. But we need to be smart about it and make sure that we make, when we, when we actually make the decision um, to clearly move ahead, that it is the right decision and we've structured it in the right way. Thank you. Mr. Sukou, same question. What do you consider to be the most important capital project to be addressed by the next government? I think the most important capital investment that we can make um, in, in the upcoming administration is going to be investing in education. We, I'm not talking about just building schools for the sake of building schools, but we're sitting here in Savannah Primary. This school is overcrowded. I visit Bordentown Primary. The school is overcrowded. Kids can't learn in that, that form of environment. It, um, it, it, classrooms are overcrowded, they're not learning well. Um, we also need to look at the resourcing. You know, I understand that just building a school isn't gonna do it, but technical and vocational, I think if we look at the most popular, look at the areas where we grant the most work permits uh, for individuals who are performing trades, and maybe those are the areas where we can have an on-island local trade school. You know, construction might be one, uh, you know, wherever it is that we're granting the most work permits for those types of jobs. But more local to Newlands, um, then Bordentown in general, we have not invested in infrastructure. This, I'm talking about the schools here. We need a third school in Bordentown. We don't have sidewalks in our streets. We don't have proper drainage control. We don't have proper lighting. It is unsafe. You know, I, I get requests all the time for people who need proper lighting in their neighborhoods. Their houses have been broken into. That's, that's an effect, a direct impact on our security, the security of our people. You know, um, the Bordentown Clinic needs to be expanded. It closes at 5 p.m. People come home to Bordentown from work. They may have to go and see a doctor. They have to go back to Georgetown. The police station, it serves three districts, and it's not a fully functional police station. We have to wait sometimes for response from Georgetown Police Headquarters. We need all those things, our infrastructure developments that are priority and that have been overlooked for four years and more. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. What do you consider to be the most important capital project to be addressed by the next government? Most capital um, project that is important to me, I feel is gonna be our people of the Cayman Islands. Uh, we need to invest in them and like I said earlier, we have a lot of Caymanians that are 
unemployed. We have to get them employed. We have a lot of them that are, um, their education skills need to be brought up. Um, the world is changing daily, so we have to get them prepared and make them accessible to, um, to, 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 to these things that are there that they could elevate themselves. Uh, we shouldn't be putting stumbling blocks. And before I bring a motion or agree to any other buildings or anything like that, I want to do a trade school, vocational, um, tweak our education system. Um, we need we need to work with, um, like I say, from primary school, come right up, get our kids in, in, um, educated, get them prepared, because Cayman is moving too fast for them. Um, there's too much families breaking up too because of, like I say, lack of employment, um, lack of, of funds, houses are being taken away. These are the things that we need to address. Um, there's, to me, you know, it's not, it's not the country that makes the people, it's the people that makes the country. And our people are suffering. So m to me, the capital project is going to be our people. And we have to spend whatever it takes, whatever resources that are available, it has to go back on our people. Um, like I said, it starts with our kids. We said that our kids are our future and our dreams, and, and we want the best for them. So we have to, like I said, all resources has to go on them. And the families, we need to help their families here now to, to make a living. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes the second round of questions. Please stay tuned. We'll be accepting audience questions right after this break. So we've already talked about what economic growth means and why it's so important. But how do we achieve economic growth? Well, remember the three tiers of the Cayman Islands economy? In a way, each tier is like a separate economy in its own right. They each have different growth drivers and different obstacles to growth. So let's look at each tier and see how we can help them grow. Let's start with tier three. Remember, tier three is made up of all the companies that sell products and services to the residents of the Cayman Islands, like Foster's, Kirk's, Hurley's, Scott's Marine, A.L. Thompson's, Cox Lumber, Champion House, Ala Kebab, and so on. So how can we help these companies grow? Let's look at a great example of a tier three company, a hairdressing salon. To increase revenue, the hair salon could spend more money on marketing and win customers that way. More customers means more revenue, right? Right. However, that's not economic growth because although more customers would mean more revenue, that's only because another salon's revenue went down. If you could look at the hairdressing sector as a whole, the overall revenue or demand stayed exactly the same. Even if an entrepreneur came along and opened a new salon, that wouldn't be economic growth either because again, demand for hairdressing hasn't changed. That doesn't mean having more salons is a bad thing, but it's not economic growth. So the question is really, what would have to happen to increase demand for hairdressing? Well, two things. First, disposable incomes could go up. Disposable income is what people have left over after they've paid for important things like housing and food. When disposable income goes up, people have more money to spend on things like hairdressing. When disposable income goes down, like during a recession, people look for ways to cut back on spending, so they visit hair salons less often. And what could cause disposable income to increase? You guessed it, economic growth. The second way to increase demand would be to increase the population. More people means more customers buying more products and services from tier three businesses like hairdressers. So in that way, population growth actually helps our tier three businesses. Now, not everyone agrees that population growth is a good thing, and that's fine. But because population growth is both a cause and result of economic growth, trying to grow the economy without growing the population is like standing in a bucket and trying to lift yourself up by the handle. It's not going to get you anywhere. In the next video, we'll look at how tier 2 companies fit into the economy and how to help them grow. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine.
If you're looking for extra savings and free benefits with car insurance and home insurance, Brit K has just the cover you need. There's a free $250 gift voucher for new home insurance customers, too, and 10% car insurance discount if you have home insurance. With a claim service that's quick and friendly, we call it Cover Without Added Costs. Call for a quote on 949-8699 or visit BritK.ky. Brit K, where people come first. Have you heard? They have new daily meal deals at Popeyes. A different meal with side every day of the week for the same price of just $3.99. Monday is chicken soup with rice. Tuesday for hush puppy shrimp. Two tenders on Wednesday. A loaded chicken wrap on Thursday. It's all about that shrimp on Friday. Chicken nuggets to start the weekend. And the mixed two-piece to finish. The new daily meal deals from Popeyes. A different meal every day served with the world of famous best dressed chicken for only $3.99. Only at Popeyes, Louisiana Kitchen on Eastern Avenue. C3 Pure Fiber broke the Caymanian record of the first 100% fiber optic network. Do you know what it feels like to be fiber fast? It feels like this, like your whole life passing beneath your fingertips, like your world is living with you, like everything in your whole life is always connected. We are a new breed of connectivity and we are ready for you. TV from 59, internet from 69, bundles from 89, and home phone from 9. Join us today, 333-3333 or c3.ky. Looking for quality products with the best prices? Then come to Uncle Bill's. We carry the best bicycle brands on island. You can also make a custom order and pick up items from our great line of accessories. We have a fantastic range of stainless steel, gas, and charcoal grills. And make sure to check out our great line of DeWalt power tools. Plus our newest product, the FlexVolt. Have the freedom of cordless. Come and visit us today. Uncle Bill's Home Improvement Center. If it matters to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Welcome back to the Savannah Primary School Hall, where we have the three candidates for Newlands. We've gone through two rounds of questions. Now we turn it over to the audience, and we've been posing questions from the audience. I'll turn it back over to Paul Biles. Thanks, Will. Our first question from the audience focuses on the financial services industry. It says, politics is not only local. Over the years, we have had to represent the Cayman Islands on serious issues in financial services. How prepared are you and do you feel you are capable to handle these issues on an international level? I'll start this question with Mr. Saku. Thank you. Yeah, I think I am, I am quite prepared to, to represent the country internationally and locally. Um, you know, I, I do have a lot of private sector experience doing just that. You know, I, I work for one of the major law firms on the island. Um, I had to travel and work overseas quite a bit. Um, I have represented the government um, at, at, at CPA conferences overseas. I have to deal with all the politicians, um, represent the Cayman Islands at, at that level. So, and I do have a, a keen understanding of the importance of financial services. I, as I said, worked in financial services throughout most of my career. So I do understand the importance of financial services to our economy. I have recognized that recently there's been a level of, of shrinkage that we need to be concerned about. Um, we need to ensure that we continue to, to market our financial services overseas, represent um, the Cayman Islands overseas, and do that through partnership with, with the people who have the financial service providers, um, businesses here. Um, it has to be a partnership. You know, the government can't do it all alone and the private sector can't do it all alone. It has to be a, par a partnership. I fully support Cayman Finance. I think they're doing a tremendous job in representing the jurisdiction and bringing concerns to the government. Um, what I think we need to do more of is encouraging the, the firms who have presences overseas to engage more with um, the government and, and, understand, and helping the government understand what their needs are. Um, from a marketing point of view, 
And I think the government can then put a little bit more effort into assisting with that marketing effort. It has to be a partnership. But I, I think I'm prepared um, to, I wouldn't say that financial services is a ministry that I um, eyeing um, next time around. However, I think I, if given to me, I would be in a position to, to perform the job well. Thank you, Mr. Saku. Mr. Gonzalez, same question to you. Politics is not only local. Over the years, we have had to represent the Cayman Islands on a number of serious issues in the financial services industry. How prepared are you, and do you feel you are capable to handle these issues on an international level? Yes, I am prepared, and I'm more than capable of handling the issues. Um, our finance industry is a very important um, industry. It's very vital to this this country it gives us more than half of the government revenue. So as God spare, um, when I do get in, I will be pushing as much resource as possible to, to help our finance, because we need to protect our islands. Um, and Mr. Jude Scott, the head of finance, is doing a superior, superior job in doing just that. But he needs more resources and I think they need more, they need that, it has to be the partnership. The government has to put in more with them. It, you know, it's a 50-50. It's um, so, like I said, I would be backing it 100%. And if it was, I'm not, a, I'm not a, an accountant, I'm not the, never been the finance minister of any sort, but I've run my business, I've, I know about business, I know about the books, balancing and so forth. But like I say, um, if it's awarded to me, um, I have no issues um, taking it head on because I would have people I would learn, I would, I would delegate and have people who would um, help me to make an informed decision and what needs to be done. I'm not afraid to go and seek the help that I need in, in that position. And like I say, it would be like the, the likes of Mr. Jude Scott and people of that caliber. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Panton, politics is not only local. Over the years, we have had to represent the Cayman Islands on a number of serious issues in the financial services industry. How prepared are you, and do you feel you are capable of handling these issues on an international level? Thank you very much. Um, obviously, as the current Minister for Financial Services and one who has a track record over the last four years of confronting a number of, of issues um, and delivering very significantly for the financial services industry. Um, obviously the answer is yes, um, I am prepared and it is a role that I have, I think I have performed very effectively. Um, you know, the financial services industry is, is very critical to us. Um, it employees around 4,000 Caymanians. Uh, and I think about those Caymanians every single day um, that I go to work and, and do my job. Um, whether I am in Cayman or whether I am overseas uh, business developing, uh, building relationships, or talking to international regulators um, and trying to address um, misperceptions, uh, misconceptions, um, and threats to, to the financial services industry. So it is, it is an industry that is very, very important to the country. It's very important to me. Um, I have been in that industry for the last 30 years, so I know what the opportunities are, and I have personally been engaged in creating opportunities for Caymanians to, um, to be involved uh, in it and to benefit from it. So I want to see that continue. Um, and there is, there is no doubt that this government has dealt with um, a whole agenda of um, issues in relation to the financial services industry um, and delivered very, very effectively for the industry. We have supported financial services and collaborated and worked with them. Very clearly, it is critical to us um, to collaborate with industry as a whole and obviously through Cayman Finance. Um, we have done that, we have supported them, and they have worked with us very effectively. 
Thank you, Mr. Panam. Our next question focuses on our youth. I'm going to start with Mr. Gonzalez. What do you consider to be the top issue facing our youth today? The top issue facing our youth today, um, a lot of things. Um, education being the, the main thing. Um, they're going to schools the way our system is right now. It's like an assembly line. Whether they pass their grades or not, they're, they're being graduated. And we're, we're doing an injustice to our kids because we're graduating them and, and, and they're not prepared for the real world. So we need to, we need to, we need to fix that. We need to, we need to fix that education system that we can prepare our kids. So when they come out, they could get the, the right jobs. We need to have um, people in schools who could, you know, um, see what it is they, what, what it is they, they like, what it is they want to do. Um, not everyone's going to be a doctor, not everyone's going to be a, a, an accountant, you know, so we need to have those trade schools in place and prepare our, 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 our people for too long now. I mean, we've lost generations and we can't lose no more. We can't afford to lose no more because we're, we're, not, we're not producing Caymanians. I mean, just like that, it, it ain't happening, right? So the ones that are coming up here now, we have to, we have to educate them, we have to prepare them for the real world. Um, and the ones that are, are, are left behind, we have to bring them up. And we also have to help the families, the parents, right? Because there's a lot of broken homes due to the cost of living. So it, it's a mirror of things that are, are happening, right? So we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and we just have, we, have, we have to tackle it. We have to tackle the homes, the families, assist them, help those parents. Right? So in turn, they could be there for their kids too, right? And then as a government, we have to have a partnership with the families to bring our kids up, because they are our future. They are the future of the Cayman Islands. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Panton, same question to you. What do you consider to be the top issue facing our youth today? Well, I think we, we absolutely have to be investing more in our, in our young people. Um, and I, I, I agree that you know, not all um, of our young people want to go into some sort of profession or have a professional qualification. We should try to encourage them to follow their passion and provide avenues for them to, to do that. Create a constructive environment, a supportive environment. Um, we absolutely have to ensure that, um, you know, the, we take a sort of multifaceted approach, whether we need to support them um, on the family side um, or whether we need to support them in terms of making the investments to ensure that they have those avenues open to them to get qualifications, to get um, training. Those, that's, that is absolutely um, a, a given. Um, young people today, I think, are challenged in ways that we weren't challenged, you know, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, in some cases, growing up. Um, the world has changed, expectations are different and higher. And we've got to make sure we adjust to that. And one of the things I have tried to do, for example, is uh, with a, a platform for um, intellectual property modernization, was to ensure that we provide a supporting environment for um, the digital economy and to, to really address a framework that helps to support the, the, the things that really excites young people today, like um, in, you know, information technology and developing and writing applications and this sort of thing. Um, so we need to have across the board an environment where they can, they can enjoy themselves, they can, they can have um, you know, recreational centers, but they have access to education and the types of activities in education that they are interested in. And we encourage them and support them in that respect. Thank you, Mr. Panan. Mr. Saku. What do you consider to be the top issue facing our youth today? I think the, I mean, there's so many issues affecting our young people, but for me to sum it all up in, in, a, in a concept, I think our young people need for us to stop sitting on these forums and on election platforms and making promises and saying that we're taking them seriously and we're concerned about them, and we need to start doing 
we need to start listening to our young people. I have a lot of people on my, my re-election committee who are young, very young. I have made, it, made an effort to engage with young people. They're losing hope. A lot of the young people that I have encountered over the past four years and beyond have lost hope that we are taking them seriously and that we are, we are looking out for them. They see the big developments going on. They see a lot of high-level stuff happening that doesn't affect them, or their perception is, is that it doesn't affect them and it doesn't benefit them. We're talking about education. You know, we've talked about education. I don't know how many election cycles now. I recently moved the motion in, in the, the LA, uh, an amendment to uh, actually was a, an, a bill that Mr. Panton brought asking for young, well, well anybody, any Caymanian who's engaged in creating art, music, um, anything creative, artistic, um, if they were doing that and, and they wanted to make a living from it, that they wouldn't require a business license. That was passed. I have in my manifesto that I'm going to create a national youth committee made up of young people who are going to advise the government. And I'm talking about picking young people from all across this, this society who can get involved in the, the political process and, and have some hope that they're going to be listened to once and for all. You know, the education concerns have always been there, but the young people don't feel as if their country and their government is really looking out for their future. And we need to restore hope of our young people or the next generation is, is, is lost. Thank you, Mr. Sko. Our next question, we will start with Mr. Panton. What plans do you have to upskill the trades of the unskilled workforce? Thank you. Um, the, the, for those that are, that are unskilled, you know, we need to make, and again, I go back to making an investment in identifying those that perhaps are not interested in some sort of academic approach or professional qualification and giving them the opportunity to identify with whatever it is that's making, that drives their passion um, and gives them an interest and a purpose. And I think we do that through um, working through public-private partnerships. I don't, at this point, believe that it makes sense for us to invest in putting in place a large um, sort of uh, trade school. Um, I believe that our population perhaps is not large enough for that at this point. Um, but I think that given where we are with financial resources and the improvements in the financial resources for the country, and because of the job we've done with stabilizing finances um, and improving the country's position, I think we have the ability to make more and more investments and create public-private partnerships, have some of these young people go into relationships with employers similar to the ready-to-work program that has been done, but on a sort of expanded basis. If we have to subsidize um, some of their salaries, we do that. Um, at this point right now with the ready-to-work program, only about 20% of the employers, of the 50-odd employers that are involved are seeking, um, uh, seeking a contribution to their salaries. I think we can, we can do the same thing, um, even, as I said, even if we have to subsidize it further. And I think then we send them, once they have established that working relationship and they've demonstrated the interest, give them a scholarship, send them away to get the training. Then when they come back, they've already got a built-in employment relationship and they know that they can then move forward with the, um, the, the business that they have that relationship with. Uh, today, if we, if we send the child off um, and just have them quali get qualified, they come back not knowing exactly where they're going to work and they have to fight just like everybody else. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Panna. Mr. Saku, same question to you. What plans do you have to upskill the trades of the unskilled workforce? Well, I, I, I think I've commented on this one so many times in the past four years that it, it's almost starting to sound repetitive, but, you know, technical and vocational training. That is an area that we have overlooked, that we have not focused on. Um, I agree with Mr. Panton. We don't need to build trade schools, but we need to to make sure that we, we provide the avenues you, through public-private partnerships that young people can get access to that technical training 
but let's make sure that when they, they complete that, that they've received a recognized qualification. Because um, my, my fear is that if, if, we, if we don't do that, then they end up right back where they started. Um, and not just young people, you know, you have people who are not so young, but want to upskill. So we need to also look at providing avenues for people to do that. They may not want to necessarily go and get a, a bachelor's degree or an associate's, but they may want to, to learn a trade or, or a skill. So we need to make sure that con adults get continuing um, education as well. You know, the way we do that, we leverage the existing schools. Clifton Hunter closes down at night. Let's offer some technical courses there, certification courses there for, for you know, um, not so young Caymanians who have finished work, working their day job, but they want to, to improve themselves. You know, we, Mr. Connolly and I, Winston Connolly and I moved the motion in the LA asking for 10% of every work permit, the revenue from every work permit to be earmarked for education. If we had done things like that, I think that we, we would be much further down the road in being able to provide these solutions for our people. Because um, there's always gonna be that cost factor. You know, how are we gonna pay for this? That was one solution I thought that um, you know, would have solved a lot of these issues, something that we really should have done a long time ago. Um, let's, we're taking in work permit revenue, well then let's put that to work to preparing our people to take those jobs eventually. And through attrition, the work permits may reduce, but you're gonna have more Caymanians employed and contributing to the economy. Thank you, Mr. Sako. <laughs> Mr. Gonzalez, same question to you, sir. What plans do you have to upskill the trades of the unskilled workforce? Uh, we need to, I think we need to create like a, we need the vocational and the trade school, make it free. Um, we need to further educate and grow the ones that are not skilled. The programs that we have now are not working, they're only working for some. We need programs that are gonna work for all because you could just see it, a lot of them is just falling right through the cracks. So we, 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 it gets right back to vocational and, and trade school. We need it. We don't need to build no buildings. We have, we have buildings that are there. We got the schools we could use. We do a public and private partnership. Um, the government needs to step in and, and really work with these private companies to get our people um, educated, get, them, get their skills up. Um, without that, it ain't going to work, right? And, and that's what we need. Um, and the, the time is, has, it has come where we have to stop talking and just do it. Um, it's, we're, we're the ones who are losing our kids, our future, the Caymanians. So, like I say, we, get, we just got to do it. We got UCCI, we got ICCI, and we got a mirror of the companies that are willing to come on board. But again, our government... Um, they're supposed to be leading the country, right? And, and everyone else will follow the government. But how it is here now, it's the private sector and, 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 and it's a, a few of them, the big shots that are, are leading the government and are leading our country. And that has to change. It has to come back to where the Caymanian people are, are leading and they, they put the people inside there to voice their concerns. And, and lead the government where it needs to go in the country, where it needs to go for the Caymanian people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That concludes the first round of audience questions. After these short messages, we'll return with more questions from our audience. Please stay tuned. Catch the trials and the tribulations of the bold and the beautiful people of the fashion world of Beverly Hills. Watch the bold and the beautiful afternoons on Cayman 27. Make the most of your morning at Burger King with Burger King's unbeatable breakfast special. Two croissant sandwiches for just $4. Take two bacon, egg, and cheese croissant sandwiches, two sausage, egg, and cheese, or mix and match. Add a refreshing OJ or delicious hash browns Plus tea or coffee for a true breakfast of champions. Two Chris sandwiches for just $4, available until 10.30 weekdays and 11 a.m. on weekends. Only at Burger King, Seven Mile Beach, Waterfront, Walker's Road, Town Center Plaza, and now Red Bay. Children are our future, so let's preserve the ecosystems of Cayman by using cleaner gas. 
Using propane releases 80% fewer harmful emissions into the environment and saves you significantly on your energy spent annually. Working with us during the entire process and our outstanding customer service will make you know that you made the right choice. By partnering with ProSolar, we are also able to provide solutions for zero net energy homes. Clean gas, superior energy, the smarter choice. Every Wednesday and Saturday, don't miss Extra Time, the football show that goes beyond the goals and brings you in-depth coverage of all things football. Find out about your favorite team, catch up with the players, and see what's trending in the world of football. And of course, some of the best goals you've ever seen. Extra Time on K-Man 27, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and Saturdays at 5 p.m. Welcome back to the Savannah Primary School Hall, where we have three candidates from the Electoral District of Newlands. We are now into second round of audience questions. I turn them back, turn the turn this back over to Paul. Thank you. We'll start the next question with Mr. Saku, and it focuses on national energy. A proposed national energy policy released by government seeks to have 70% of all Cayman's energy generated by renewable sources in 20 years and moving toward 100% if possible. What are your thoughts on this issue? Well, I, I completely support the, the national energy policy. Um, I am very pleased that we now have a policy um, because now we can be guided in, in, in how we move forward with adapting uh, renewable energy adapting to renewable energy. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize the significance of where we are now in terms of renewables and, and, and in comparison to other neighboring jurisdictions, neighboring countries who are well over 50% in, in most cases. And these are developing countries, not countries as developed as the Cayman Islands. So I wholeheartedly support the, the adoption of the national energy policy. Um, I am excited about it. Uh, I actually, again, moved a motion, me and uh, Mr. Winston Connolly, asking for just that. Um, recently in the Legislative Assembly, we recognize that the, the benefits, not only to the business community in terms of reducing costs over time, but in also in the terms of, of you know, what it does for our environment, you know, getting off fossil fuels, getting um, cleaner energy, um, it, it does so much for our environment, it does so much for our, our health. So, you know, I would like to see us get to 100% at some point. I know that the technology may be not as reliable as it should be right now, it, you know, but over 20 years, I, I, I anticipate vast improvements um, in renewable energy. And I think that in 20 years, we could be looking at nearing a 100%. So, you know, I, I fully support it. and. Um, in the next administration, I will continue that support and try to encourage as much as I can the, the adoption of renewable energy. Thank you, Mr. Saku. Mr. Gonzalez, same question to you. A proposed national energy policy released by government seeks to have 70% of all Cayman's energy generated by renewable sources in 20 years and moving toward 100% sooner if possible. What are your thoughts on this issue? I'm I'm glad that they moved towards that, um, that they had put something in place. Um, that's great. But I still feel that we as Caymanians shouldn't be waiting no 20 years. Um, it's, too, it's too far away. It's now. We're here now. So our government and our past government's been um, in third gear. We need, to, we need to get to fifth and sixth gear here now. And God spare when I get in, like I say, and be part of the government, we are going to push for it. We need to get that national policy to energy um, a lot further, not no 20 years from now. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't happen a lot faster. Resources are here. The sun is out there. It's for free. Um, clean gas. Um, it, we could go with that too. 
whatever it needs to be done, we got to do it because our people are suffering now, right? And they can't wait no 20 years or 15 years. It has to happen now. And I think we've been slaves to CUC for far too long. So that has to change, and it will be changed immediately. We are going to work towards that. Um, people, if you could afford to have solar, banks are giving you 100% solar now, and you, they can't get it because they have to get permission from all sorts of red tape in the, in, in, in the forefront and stumbling blocks to why. Too much entities or the big corporations are controlling us, and that has to stop, and it needs to stop. Like I say, our Caymanians are suffering. The cost of living is up too high, and it's hurting our families. It's hurting our kids. It's, it's detrimental to us. So we need that clean energy. I'm glad the government did the stride that they did. They started something, but we're going to finish it, though. We're going to carry it to the finishing line. Thank you. Mr. Panda, same question. A proposed national energy policy released by government seeks to have 70% of all Cayman's energy generated by renewable sources in 20 years and moving toward 100% sooner if possible. What are your thoughts on this issue? Thank you very much for the, the question. Um, obviously, as a member of the, the government um, who moved, moved the um, national energy policy forward, I entirely support it. Um, not just for that reason, um, but I'm also, as a, as a Minister for the Environment, there are clear, clear benefits um, to taking that approach. Um, you know, the, the single largest sort of chokehold on the economy is um, the cost of, of energy production um, for small islands such as ourselves. Um, and obviously it's a significant factor in our cost of living for you know, those, those of us um, individuals, <clears throat> but who have to pay these bills. But I, I, I don't want people to get the expectation that even if we transition in a very rapid way to um, solar energy or wind power, um, that we are, we are going to see a substantial drop right now in, in energy costs. The real benefit to us is down the road um, being able to mitigate um, shocks from, you know, oil price increases and that sort of thing. We've had we had that um, a number of years ago when it when it um, spiked up to $150 a barrel. Um, it will it will ensure that we have a, a smooth, consistent supply of electricity. And the challenge, of course, with renewable energy, is making sure that it is. Um, it creates, or you have the, the proper grid stability with it. So as technology improves, um, I think we will see more of an acceleration towards that. Um, we are exploring other forms of renewable energy other than just solar and wind, such as um, ocean, ocean thermal energy conversion. Uh, that's something that's being done in Northside. They're doing an environmental impact assessment on that. But effectively, this is a very good thing for the country. And the quicker and the faster we can move towards it, the better it is for our environment, and it addresses issues of, of um, climate change for us as well, which should be a concern for us. Thank you, Mr. Panin. <laughs> Next question from the floor concerns our pensions again. And we will start with Mr. Gonzalez. Why can't our pensions be put into a designated bank locally instead of in private companies? when we're all losing our money in stocks? It's a good question. I'm glad you brought it up, because I'm very passionate about that too. I always grew up hearing, don't put your eggs in one basket. I don't believe in that. Our basket is the Cayman Islands. And I think, and if God's willing and the people entrust me and put me in, and I'm part of the government, we are going to push for all our pension to come back to the Cayman Islands. If we could manage 70% of the world's hedge funds, why can't we manage our own pension, right? I don't see, I don't see the logic in that. Um, we need our pension here on this island. We need to invest it in the likes of Water Authority, um, Credit Union, um, CUC to push them a lot further with the renewable energy that the people so much need. 
um, and, and, in our, and, and in our education system, we could use some of that funds too, and, and in return, we get back the dividends that we need for our people. At least we could see where our money is going. It's here for the people. It's overseas, you're getting a letter, you lost thousands of dollars, that's it. No, 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 I prefer to see, and I'm sure the Caymanian people wants to see their funds, and if it's lost, it's lost in their, their soil. If everyone is developing their country, and, and invest in it there, and, and like I say, develop in their country, why can't we do it in our country? We have, the, we have very intelligent people on our island here that are qualified and capable of handling the Caymanian money. We work for it, it's our money, it needs to be here. We're growing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Pannon, same question to you, sir. Why can't our pensions be put into a designated bank locally instead of private companies when we're losing our money in stocks? I think, you know, the, the issue with pensions is that you always have to take a long-term perspective on it. And I know I, I, I have the same feelings when I, if I look at my pension statement, um, and it looks like I have lost money in the short term, I am bothered about that. Um, so I have the same reaction that everybody else has. But you have to think about it in a, in a more long-term way. Um, and obviously it depends on, on your age as well. If you put the money in the bank, um, you're going to get negligible returns on it. Um, when, you are, when, you, when you have a pension, if you, the older you are, the more risk-averse you, you generally are or should be um, because you're trying to protect your funds, but you're going to get less returns. The younger you are, um, the more appetite for risk you can have um, and you can get greater returns, but there is volatility. Um, we, have, we have had an unprecedented period um, in, in recent times um, with the global financial crisis um, and you know the markets have started to come back and they're, they're growing quite well now. I think um, you know, pension returns have been improving, but we have gone through a period where they were very volatile and we did, we did make losses. Um, you're not going to get the benefit down the road um, of it, putting money in your bank today um, to grow your, your pension so that you can actually retire in 20 or 30 years' time. It's not going to happen. Um, it, can, it can mean the difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars to you. So putting it in a bank today is not, is not a wise approach. Um, we also have the ability under the current rules to invest in Cayman. So the question is, why aren't our um, uh, service providers and their investors seeking investments in Cayman for the pension funds? Um, I don't know what the answer to that is, but that's something that I would like to, to try to encourage more of. I think they can invest up to about 10 or 15 percent. Um, and we can certainly encourage um, further investment in Cayman with those funds. Thank you. Mr. Saku, why can't our pensions be put into a designated bank locally instead of private companies when we're losing our money in stocks? Well, I, I think the, the obvious answer is the, the rate of return. Um, I, I think we all know what happens when we put money into a savings account. Even fixed deposits locally, you know, we don't get much of a rate of return. Um, you know, I am I'm of two minds because I understand the risk. If, if you put all of your, your pension money in a bank here, our economy is smaller, more susceptible to, susceptible to risk. So you are in, increasing the, the amount of risk that, is a, that, is, that could affect your, your pension funds. However, investment managers do invest our pension money overseas in different markets and so forth. That is, I think that's a more diversified situation where I think they try to minimize the risk um, by spreading the investments around. They don't put it all in one basket overseas either. But recent times we have seen that when you open your pension statement, you've lost value on your pensions in the short term. So of course I agree that people become alarmed with that. And, I, I, and you know, we have to understand that the, the globe, there was a global recession. So there was going to be that reduction, and it is scary when you see it. However, as things recover, your pension will recover. I do, however, support mandating that a certain percentage of our pension funds should be invested here, 
and should be used locally. I mean, I think about capital projects that the government in the future may, may want to embark on, and that money can be used um, to fund some of those, those ventures and let Caymanians also benefit from a, a, a rate of return on their investment that is connected to ongoing capital projects that the government is involved in. So I, I am supportive of mandating that a certain percentage stays here, um, but we can't make that um, to, the, to the level where the risk becomes too high. So, you know, the 10, 15 percent, maybe if we mandated that, that, I think that would be acceptable. But I agree, we, we need to invest locally. Thank you, Mr. Siku. Next question, we will start with Mr. Panton, and it focuses on the permanent residency applications. A very simple question. What is your position on the backlog of the permanent residency applications? Well, <clears throat> um, I think it, it presents a, a difficulty. Um, you know, there are lots of people who, um, whose lives they feel are in, are in limbo. Um, they feel that they're unable to, to move on. And it has really been too long to be in that, to be in that sort of situation. So the government has taken the, the advice, um, this rich report um, that we all are aware of, and we have taken certain actions to ensure that this can, this um, the, the problems that have been identified can be resolved and the process can move forward. Um, you know, ironically though, there, there are people who feel that, you know, this is not, not necessarily a bad thing and, you know, there, it's, you can feel some sympathy in that respect as well. Um, but overall, for us to continue to succeed as a country um, and to have uh, skilled people who are a part of our country. I mean, we have teachers, for example, who come in here and who work hard and who teach our children. Why shouldn't they be, they be, be able to um, become um, permanent residents and eventually become um, Caymanians as well? Um, we should not have a system which, which creates um, problems and pre creates a, a roadblock in that respect. And I think where we're at right now is that we're able to move forward. As I said before, the problem has been that there is, um, uh, there is a system which relies on data and there is imperfect data or missing data. And I think we have um, put in place a, a, a way around that and I, I expect to see that change very soon um, and to start to see some of these things um, be resolved. But it must be resolved, I think. Um, it's not fair for it to, to stay as it is. Thank you. Mr. Saku, same question to you. What is your position on the backlog of permanent residency applications? This situation is a good example of mismanagement. This situation didn't come up yesterday. This has been around, we've known about it for quite some time. Um, I think that the urgency was not addressed. Um, so we ended up with this backlog of PR applications. People's lives were put on hold, they were in limbo. People didn't know what was going to happen. Some, a lot of them still don't know. Um, we're seeing the lawsuits piling up. Um, we saw the rich report being, the, the, the battles didn't seem to be about solving the problem. It seemed to be about suppressing information. I think that was really responsible of the government. Um, that rich report may contain information that is, that is proprietary, or it may be confidential, or you know, deal with national security issues, however, so, or not the entire report. I would, I would dare say that it could have been redacted and released. Um, we, we really don't know where we are with PR because most, only the, I'm assuming the cabinet has seen that report. However, I am very concerned that the number of lawsuits seem to be building. And I remember being part of the government caucus, getting calls from the immigration board members, waving the flag and saying, look, we have a serious problem. We need to meet with cabinet we need to get this resolved. And I didn't see much action taking place or any urgency. So that's why we're here now dealing with this issue and potentially having to pay out lots of money in lawsuits. It's, it's, um, to me, it was a classic case of mismanagement and not listening to the people that you've put on the boards who are dealing with the problem. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez, same question to you, sir. 
What is your position on the backlog of permanent residency applications? Glad that my two colleagues, left and right, um, talking about the rich report that I mentioned earlier and realizing that people's lives are in limbo because two of them are, is part of the government and was. <laughs> sorry, was part of the government, stand to be corrected. Um, again, we weren't privy to the rich report. They were. They didn't act on it. Um, it just goes to show they, they spend money on these reports as usual and put them on the shelf to catch dust. People lives they're playing with. We don't play with people's lives. Um, especially, you know, people who contribute to our, our, our society. Like Mr. Panton said, teachers, for example, and, and a lot of people in all, all walks of life that help and contribute here and have lived here and made a living and they're just in limbo. That cannot, that's, that's unacceptable. And like I said, God spare, when we get in, we will make the changes that needs to be done. Um, the previous governments only want to do what is clean. I mean, what they think is easy. They don't want to make the hard decisions that needs to be done, take the action that needs to be done. Um, they get these recommendations, um, like the Rich Report, and they don't act on it. They need to act on it. It's like I said again, it's our lives, it's the people's lives that we're talking about, and we're Caymanians, we're all here, um, not just the born Caymanians. We're all in one country. We got to do what we got to do and what is right for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with uh, Mr. Saku. How do you intend to address special edu education needs in this country? We, well, I think we have now seen, I think most people have, would have seen the, um, the recent inspection reports, um, baseline inspection reports, which highlighted significantly um, the need for, for us to address that specific area. Um, you know, it's a matter of priorities. The education system hasn't received the, the level of, of attention that I think it needed. Um, we, we saw the minister come to finance committee with a budget that was deficient. Um, I got up in finance committee and asked her to find more money. They had to go away and find 1.8 million to fund 50 further um, positions that would have addressed some of those needs identified in that report. Um, we need to make education the priority. We haven't been doing that. You know, if, if, the, if the government could go in and come back with another 1.8 million, clearly that, that those funds were there from the beginning. So don't tell us that you don't have enough money in the budget for education. We have money in the budget for Georgetown revitalization. We have money in the budget to move forward with the port and so forth. Let's put education at the, at the top of that priority list as well. Um, our children should be our number one priority. And it's just a matter of balancing, I mean, I understand you can't ignore everything else and just spend all your money in one place, but we haven't done that. I'm looking at countries like Barbados. When their kids come out of high school, they have private sector individuals lined up, head hunting them out of high school. Why? They're, they've invested so well in their children's educations. Priority, that's all it is. It, it's just a simple shift in policy. You know, let's not build a basketball gym at, 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 at the high school in town. Um, John Gray, let's start with building classrooms. Simple. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Gonzalez, same question to you. How do you intend to address special education needs in this country? Well, we need to enhance our lighthouse school. We need to put, uh, we need to put more funding in our education system to, to help with this. Um, we need to educate our people, you know, um, about the disabilities and, and, and what the families are going through and what the kids are going through um, in order to, to help them, you know, to, to, to have a better life and a better, a better success. Um, so, like I say, we have to just find the resources, put it in the schools, enhance our lighthouse school, um, hire the proper people, 
um, that could assist and in, 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 in with this this part of the education system as a government we, we just have to find the resources and do it um, we we've far too long been talking about it too and and nothing has been happening towards that uh, we'll find funds for roads and everything else and our disability people they're being left to the side um, they're getting underfunding and like like the lighthouse school and even not even disabilities even our schools are getting underfunding you know teachers has to find paper buy buy their pens buy papers for the class all that has to stop like i say our national project is our people we we have to we have to just put the funding in education and give them the resources that they need in all aspects not only the disabilities all of them, every one of them. They're Caymanian people. We have to do what we can to make it happen. Let's focus on that. Give the teachers what they need. Give the schools all the resources so they can all elevate and, and, and contribute and be part of society and, and, and graduate and, and, and become, become citizens and prosperous people in our society. Thank you. Mr. Pannon. How do you intend to address special education needs in this country? Thank you very much. Um, I mean, that, that, is a, that is a difficulty that we must face and, as a country, and we must continue um, to make investments, and I think we need to make more investments. What we have, the approach that we have taken typically is to um, try to ensure that children with special education needs um, remain in the same classrooms. We've taken an inclusive approach. Um, I think, I mean, it's a question of degree sometimes, but I think arguments can be made in some cases for special arrangements to be made for children with particularly difficult special education needs to, um, to have more specific attention. I, I support the approach generally of, of trying to be inclusive. Um, but if you're going to do that, then we do have to uh, provide additional resources to teachers. Um, they will need assistance. I mean, you know, there are, there are teachers who are trying to teach kids across a broad range of, of abilities, um, and those with particular difficulties, um, whether it's just a general learning disability or whether it's something more difficult like emotional um, issues, they can be a significant distraction for those those teachers, and I don't think I think when that happens, they they have a difficulty doing their job um, as good as they as as good as they could, um, and I don't think that's necessarily fair to to all the the kids. So I think we need to we need to con if we're going to continue a policy of inclusion, um, which I think is is not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. We actually have to put more investment. Um, have teachers' aides and assistants there to assist teachers in ensuring that they can conduct the lessons properly across the board so that all of our children um, benefit, um, as well as those kids that may have some difficulties um, and are getting the benefit of being a part of their, their classmate um, group. Thank you. Well, that concludes question time. Um, Believe it or not, we've gone through all the questions. Thank you for the audience questions. They were excellent. Well, please stay tuned. When we return, we're going to have the closing remarks by each of the candidates. Please stay tuned. Hi, I'm Caroline Hobby, host of Nashville Insider, where we bring you the latest in country music news and happenings. Join us as we interview your favorite artists and go behind the scenes of country music's hottest events. Watch Nashville Insider right here on Cayman 27. <laughs> Not for the first time in this test series. You might not often see us, yet we're always passing through, hidden in the background of everything you do. Who are we? 
We're Home Gas. The Clear Choice. At Kurt's Home Center. You can find everything to adapt, decorate, or furnish your home at Kirk Home Center. Discover every tool for any task in our hardware department. Fuel your imagination with our extensive range of housewares and linens. Create a home outside your house from our variety of outdoor living items. Or plan your next project in our paint and do-it-yourself section. For the widest variety of stylish and up-to-date items for your home. Make Kirk Home Center your first choice. We got a great Welcome back to the Savannah Primary School Hall, where we have the three candidates for Newlands. We've gone through both chamber questions and audience questions, and now we reach that stage of the forum where we're going to invite each of the candidates to deliver some closing remarks. And we're going to begin as our candidates are seated with Mr. Wayne Panton. Thank you very much. Um, you know, let me say that I have the, the pleasure of, of living in in Newlands, and I think I happen to think, not just because it is my home community, that it is a very wonderful um, little community, very diverse. Um, you know, you have a, a broad range of communities that exist within there, um, and there are differences in some areas. You know, some concerns people have um, in one area aren't necessarily reflected in others. We have one particular area um, in, in North Sound Estates, for example, where there are some concerns about some illegal activity or um, antisocial behavior or, th or you know, common theft type things. Um, but by and large, that's not reflected across the board. Um, and I think Newlands is a, is a, is a beautiful little place and it's, it's, you know, it's like a, um, a jewel with lots of different um, glittering stones. But the, the thing about um, Newlands for me um, is that I want to, I want to help it to, to be better. I want the communities to be able to, within Newlands, to be able to relate to each other better. It's, it is a bit of a, what you might call a stereotypical kind of bedroom community. In some cases, not all, where people sort of get up in the morning early and go to work and then come back in the evening. And not all of them know all their neighbors. And if we can, if we can improve the relationship I improve the integration of the communities. I think that's going to be even better um, and make Newlands that much more special. Um, you know, I think we can do that through um, finding ways to bring them together through, um, for example, a community emergency response team approach, a um, neighborhood watch program, getting them interacting and talking to each other. I mean, there are some concerns about, um, you know, wanting, wanting better garbage service, um, they, there are concerns about wanting to see the police there um, more frequently. Um, we do want to see, we, we do want to have places like Savannah School improved so that the, the students that come from our area um, are better served. And I think overall, I have the ability to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Raul Gonzalez, Jr. I would like to thank my constituents and the members who came out here and for those who's watching on TV tonight and the chamber for holding this forum. Um, I am new to the political arena, but um, I am bringing my heart and willingness and able and capable to work for the people. I want to be their voice for the people of Newlands and the Cayman Islands, I am willing to fight for your needs. What I plan to do for Newlands is, I agree, we have to unite our community. We are so um, segregated as a community. We need to bring back love, unity, um, caring amongst each and every one of us. Um, we have to, and, and that's where it starts, you know, um, look out for your neighbor, I'm my brother's keeper. Um, it makes no sense, you know, my household is doing good and my next door neighbors ain't doing good. Um, 
God's spear when we get in, if it's God's will and the people's will, we will form a, a district council for Newlands. I plan to uh, put 15% of my salary into those funds so we could help develop our community. Um, you know, I want to set up a program where we start helping one another, each other's homes. Every two months, we start repairing homes. Um, as a community, we come together. I want to do the sidewalks. I want to do the bus stops for our kids. Far too long, our kids are getting wet and going to school. Parents can't be sitting down there waiting. They're going to get late to work. We don't know how the traffic is. I want to put an ambulance and a fire substation at the Marine Base Unit. We don't need no buildings. We don't need no land. It's there already. All we got to do is retrofit what is there. And that's going to help the Savannah School. That's going to help the Borden Town Schools. That's going to help the community in a whole. Um, so I, I would I'd want, to, if it's your will, I would like to be your voice and the person to fight for you people and Newlands. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you. Mr. Alva Suku. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the Chamber for hosting this forum, and I'd also like to thank Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Panton. I think we had a, a very good debate. And, um, you know, I, I'm putting myself forward again. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to anyone that I would have done that. I've become known um, in Bordentown as someone who, who will put party aside, put personal agenda aside, and do what the people ask me to do. Um, I, I take my job very seriously. I think that Borden Town as a whole district, Newlands in particular, needs strong leadership now. We're moving to single member constituencies. Um, we're going to have a constituency, um, single member constituency called Newlands, and Newlands needs someone who is going to stand up for the, the wishes of the people of Newlands. I think I've demonstrated clearly where I am, I, what I will do for my constituents. I put myself in a position where I am now running as an independent. I have less advantages. I've taken a pay cut to step away from the ruling party, all because I felt that I needed to respect the wishes of the people. So I am willing to sacrifice myself on behalf of my constituents. I know that I have a lot left to offer this country. I, again, I am trying to move forward in politics. I would like to be a minister, a member of cabinet, uh, in the next administration, and, th and that is one of the things that I think will benefit Newlands, having a minister who is much more influential in cabinet, but also able to get things done for the district, the, the community. I am very community-minded. I love my constituency. I've lived in, in Barton Town for, for over 20 years now, and first uh, majority of that has been spent in Newlands. Um, I've gotten around, I've gotten to know all, most of the, all the people in Newlands now. I've been door to door. I understand the needs of the constituency. I understand the concerns. I live among the people. I visit with the people. I care about the people. I just want to serve. I have no personal business interests. My job is to be a full-time representative and nothing else. So given the opportunity, I don't think Borden Towners and Newlands represent, um, constituencies, cons constituents will be disappointed with my leadership. Thank you. I'd like to thank the candidates. And now I'm going to turn it over to Paul Biles for some closing remarks. Thanks, Will. On behalf of the Chamber Council, I would like to extend a special thanks to all the candidates for participating in tonight's forum and to the audience who have taken the time to attend as well as to submit questions. I think tonight we had uh, quite a lot of questions actually. We probably missed one or two, but it was one of the best submissions I've seen so far. We do hope that the voters here this evening and watching at home feel more informed about the positions of these candidates. I'd like to thank Hurley's Media for broadcasting tonight's forum live to the Cayman Islands via Cayman 27, and also to thank our sponsors, Dart Organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings and Puritan Cleaners. The next Candidates Forum will take place on Monday, May 8th at First Baptist Church and the Georgetown East candidates will include Teresa Borden, Roy McTaggart, Sharon Rolston and Mr. Kenrick Webster. Remember to visit caymanchamber.ky for news on the elections and our forums. 
You can find voting and voter ID collection locations on our site also. Thank you for supporting the Chamber of Commerce Candidate Forums and have a good night. to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Coming up, the Billboard Music Awards nominations are in. We'll tell you who leads the country categories. We'll bring you